abstract art. It is fundamentally a representational painting of the political, economic, and social changes uh, in abstract art in particular. And so you can see this is a very, very different kind of work of art that is not so easy to embrace or to understand. Now, so why is it then that the public, because it uh, looks at this kind of work of art and wants to walk past it and not investigate why is it that Jackson Pollock would do this kind of work. And of course, in magazines and journals everywhere, people said, my cat can do that, never mind my child. So obviously, we get this kind of satire. As my artist statement explains, my work is utterly incomprehensible and is therefore full of deep significance. The argument that I want to make today is among the others that we started with at the very beginning is that the kind of work that Jackson Pollock did here used the same tools and ideas that Leonardo da Vinci used here because both of them are following the rules of art. We'll talk about this a little bit more extensively, but the rules of art are that you should use different lines and space and value and texture and color combinations, etc., to create these kind of works so that they have balance and they have appeal. This is the design elements of these things. The materials that we see that are being used here are depression glass, teacups and various other objects that you would find in a junk shop and a Goodwill store put together to create this kind of a light fixture. And the balance and the use of contrast and colors and so on is just excellent. So this is one of the big reasons that we have it has this uh, inherent appeal. It's made of these throwaway objects. And at the same time, this person has an idea about design in the same way that this person has an idea about design. They too have purchased here glasses, reading glasses that are wire rimmed from Goodwill stores and Salvation Army thrift stores. And they made this hanging lantern over their tablecloth, their chandelier over their dining table. It's very clever to do this, but why in particular are artists doing this work right now? Because we all know this is a timely thing. This is something that is happening now in our culture because we're trying to uh, save as much trash as possible from going into dumps. So the reuse of these materials is serving an important purpose. At the same time, it is utilitarian and it is also something that is quite beautiful and unique. So the visual language of art. As I said, all artists, irrespective of which aspect of the arts they work in, are concerned about the building blocks or the tools that artists have to express their ideas, and we'll take these one at a time in just a moment. Here, what we see is using these various elements that we see there and their design properties. So let's look at the Mona Lisa again, because we're going to talk about her for a few minutes. The Mona Lisa, uh, we know that she is probably the most well-known image in the world. So not for nothing, even say at the beginning of the 1900s when tobacconists wanted to sell more tobacco, she was already famous at that point, obviously, because now they're using her as this image to sell pipe tobacco. And when Marcel Duchamp bought this uh, postcard from the Louvre, he put on it an acronym here that has to do with the lady's private part, which is a little bit rude. And he also put a mustache and goatee on her and he called it her red, uh, his ready maids. Her image was used in that way. Whereas say someone like Andy Warhol in the pop art era, one of the reasons that he became well known is he was using a technique known as silk screen that was always used to uh, dye fabric. And in kind of fabric industrial sites, that's how they use, you know, they, they made the impression 
on the on the cloth. So he did it on uh, works of art. So this brought kind of a, an interest around him that he was doing something on a large scale that was interesting and unique and had transposed the whole process. And Banksy, who is a British street artist, who I believe is still anonymous today, is showing us the Mona Lisa with weapons of mass destruction and, of course, your requisite earphones. Well, this image is used in many, many ways throughout history. Say in the case of Gustav Klimt, it's not for nothing that we see Adele Block Bauer, the lady in gold, holding her hands this way. She's sitting there in kind of this triangle shape in the same way that uh, the Mona Lisa is of Leonardo da Vinci. So let's look closely at what is it that Leonardo da Vinci did with her that was so revolutionary in his day and time. So she was painted by him in the uh, 1500s or four, very, very late 1400s. And one of the things that we see with her is though Leonardo da Vinci used a square and a circle here to show the perfect proportions of the human body, he places her in this triangular shape, which was significantly different than the way portraiture was made at his time. At this time in history, if you made a portrait of someone, it was someone very important and powerful like Henry VIII, uh, uh, and th these kind of uh, portraits are made of men in which there is a square shape where their shoulders are front and center, and there is no place for you to walk into the painting. These people are way, way above you socially, politically, economically, and consequently, there is no place for you in this world. Here again, contrast, big contrast. This is now the French Impressionist in which this table and this edge of the table is meant for you to pull up your seat here and become part of this story. You will oftentimes see these kind of paintings in which the painter is inviting you into the work so that you can visually place your chair here and become part of this wonderful party. So what we see here then is this, this, this is very, uh, a serious kind of work. Hans Holbein had his reputation made by being the painter of kings and the king of painters. But what we can see that is so significantly different here, which is really amazing, is that Leonardo da Vinci specifically places her in a triangle. And he does this to invite you into the painting. The other reason that he employs, of course, all of these aspects that we just talked about, the color is warm colors. She was a warm person. She was a humble and kind of uh, quiet, demure kind of woman. The lines that we can see are obvious in many places and sometimes very delicate, as we see here. Uh, perhaps this is a hairnet across her hair, or uh, maybe something was placed upon it. The texture is very rich. We'll talk about that in a moment. The scale is also inviting. She is, uh, though generally a, uh, there's a small painting about two feet tall, but she is large compared to the background because the emphasis is on her. So the proportion and the balance and the contrast and the rhythm are all there. And we will talk in just a moment about all those things. However, I do want to get back to one important aspect of this. And that is that he places her in this triangulated kind of shape that he's created here to invite us in. And the reason for that is because uh, Raphael had just invented this concept of a triangle as well. What we know that Leonardo da Vinci was attempting to do was to invite us in, but then the other thing he wanted to do was to anchor the work. This is the reason that these shapes are used in art, where we oftentimes don't know what the artist is doing, but they're using these primary shapes. And we'll talk a lot more about that as well to tell their story because their story becomes anchored. 
Now, continuing with, with, uh, with the, what kind of choices Leonardo da Vinci made, we have to look at all of these various aspects of it. And we can see in this, in this work, um, as, as it's enlarged here, what he did related to texture and proportion, et cetera. Well, we just said she is the most important part of the story. Consequently, her proportions are the largest. And what he does is he's trying to create a sense of rhythm so that there are, our eyes will flow over the work. This is one of the most important aspects of what makes a good painting. If your eyes want to travel across it and want to investigate it, then you can see how the artist makes it coordinated so that shapes don't fight for each other uh, for each other's space, more or less, but they're congruent. They are systematically designed to go together. Here we can see he's using lighter colors so that her arm comes forward and darker colors here because her arm is going back. So he's creating this illusion of shade. The other thing we see is these squiggly lines on her clothes are repeated in various places. So we have this continuity of design and it makes it pleasant for our eyes. Because she's sitting in a triangulated shape, he has also found ways to make these pines more triangular to complement that whole idea. In addition to that, he takes liberty with the horizon line. So what typically we say that land and the horizon line are sort of uh, where the sky meets water. So we can say if he's decided that the horizon line is here, then why has it fallen here? And this again is probably done because he didn't ever finish his work, by the way. He never finished his work. He, when you use oil paint, you can continue to elaborate and continue to fix your work. So maybe he was going to later attempt to change the horizon line. The point is it's still pleasant because we can see that the colors coordinate and he uses these lines here and the way that he uses this. So there is still a pleasant element to it and it doesn't distract the eye. But what is fundamentally interesting about this work is that most of the light is here on her decolletage and on her face, but yet he creates these shadows which we would never see in real life. And he is re realistically representing a woman as she looks. So this is quite interesting as well. And artists have talked about this for ages, maybe because he's using shadow, this invention of his, of chiaroscuro, uh, as, as we say it in English, I think it's chiara escuro in Italian or something like that. But I think we all know what we're talking about is he created these, uh, these smoky elements and also the light and shade contrast in which he creates this famous smile because he's done it with shade more so than her, say, uh, jaws going up a bit or, or, or her actual smile. It's always this big mystery. Well, the shadow, perhaps he added there to add more dimension to her because she's not a gorgeous woman. And she would have been the kind of woman uh, that would sit for these portraits because her husband was wealthy. Whereas say the trophy wives that we see here visually have a lot more going for them. In the sense that they too are sitting in this more or less triangulated way inviting you in but we can see the jewels and the opulence of the clothes. They're very simple women. Um, excuse me, they're, they're very extravagant compared to this more simple woman. Well, again, we can extrapolate all kinds of ideas from this because the longer we study any subject, we can uh, create arguments to prove what we're saying or to counter what someone else has said. But certainly all the things that I'm telling you about this have been written about for ages. This is a picture of the Renaissance. Women were demure. Women did not have so much place in society to go out and become professionals. So they dress beautifully, they act beautifully, and they do just the right thing. This is very different than 20th century women. 
20th century women who are being painted by an artist who is now using oil paint in a tube, which is very different than artists painted before with linseed oil and various loose materials, and they continue to paint in layers and layers and layers. Now you have an artist that paints with paint straight out of a tube and sometimes doesn't mix the paints so that she can get this interesting contrast that conveys to us the psychological state of these women as well. These things that happened in the 20th century were in many ways a representation of the creative mind. And this is, again, one of the reasons why we have such respect for the 20th century artists. They, it is experiments that happened at a fast clip every decade, whereas, say, decades before the Baroque era, the Renaissance era, they lasted, say, the Renaissance era could easily have lasted 200 plus years. The Baroque era, perhaps 100. Rococo, maybe 75. But now what you have is you have this quick interest in artists experimenting. And one of the reasons why they're making these kind of experiments, and certainly no one has ever seen a history painting like this, we have to talk about the form and the content and the context of why is it that Picasso would have made this work of art. And I think a lot of you know why he made this work of art because Francisco Franco colluded with other fascists and Nazis in Europe to bomb his own people into submission in this little city of Guernica. Within a few minutes of the bomb being thrown, 1,200 plus people were dead. You can understand why someone like Picasso, who is a Spaniard living in Paris, would have this particularly close connection to that part of the world and even that region of the world when he makes something that is completely new to the art world to make a history painting out of these cubist innovations that he and Brock came up with. Even this went against the tide, so to speak. Sorry to make that silly pun. This went against the tide when Jericho made this painting of the Raft of the Medusa, this tragic, tragic story in which the underclass, you know, the crew, not the people that were wearing the shiny uh, uniforms with gold buttons, but the crew were left on a raft when the large frigate Medusa started to sink. So they were left to die in this way. What happens here is that these kind of history paintings are always monumental because they want you to feel the same pain that these people experience, the same horror, because they had to commit cannibalism to uh, exist here in this way for 14, 15 days until finally they were able in the distance somewhere to uh, get another ship to, to see that they're lost at sea. Well, what we can see then is there, there are a lot of daring innovations that are going to happen in the 20th century that have a lot to say for their place and time that is significantly different than anything we've ever seen before. But in spite of that, all of the rules still apply, irrespective of Jericho making this work 200 years before the time that we're going to be talking about, he's still following the same rules, the proportion. He's inviting you in, by the way. You see why this raft is placed here? You are meant to put your foot here. The textures, the way that he's making these kind of proportional uh, swells of water, here it's violent, here it's a little bit more quiet. He's this, the rhythm and the flow of this work, look at this, this line that we're gonna talk about in a minute. These lines that he's creating here, kind of this, this the commotion, we can almost hear what's going on. And the fact that this man is lamenting their fate, because surely they will not survive this. 130 plus people died this way on the, a raft similar to this, but they were the 15 or so that survived who were also the models for this work, many of them. Again, 
This is a traditional, let's say, history painting, though it also breaks the rules. Still in all, everyone is following the same ideas. You have to go along to get along because you've only got a few options. So let's talk about color first. Color has three properties. It can be uh, bright, it can be dimmer, it can be, um, uh, it has intensity and brightness and dullness and so on. But another thing that color has that is very important to this part of our discussion coming up is that colors have inherent value because of what we have associated with them. You are green with envy, you're feeling blue and depressed, you have a purple rage, you're feeling sunny and bright, uh, the, the, the thought of someone wearing black from head to toe makes us uncomfortable because it's reminiscent of death in the way that white is reminiscent of innocence. Color. You take primary colors, you make secondary colors, you add dark and light properties, et cetera, et cetera, and you make a plethora of colors. But basically, you start with very little. In terms of shape, what kinds of shapes artists use, shapes also convey a lot of information. Though one thing that I wanted to point out at this point is that sh uh, shapes are typically two-dimensional in the way that we would see them here and the way that we see this work by Jackson Pollock. One thing that we cannot deny from this point forward is during the time when he was making these colorful, many layered pieces of art on the floor, and he was using industrial paint so that it had this kind of dripping quality because he wanted this effect. One thing that we can never say from here forward is he has no idea about shapes because art is about shapes. Even if it, they're two-dimensional or they're three-dimensional that, that give kind of volume to the storyline, they still have shapes. They're always there. One of my good friends happens to like to work with this kind of paper, with the kind of sophisticated construction paper. And what does she tell you with these shapes? you automatically get happy, even though we have very little information to work off from here. What we, we immediately know it's a happy scene. The cat, recognizable, funky. The way that the boots the guy is wearing and the woman kind of her, her, her you know, slip on shoes and so on, the mules that she's wearing. The way that their body is shaped and moving has this kind of rhythm and flow in which everyone is very jolly. Everyone is happy. Everything about it is happy. But we only have shapes that have been cut out and no eyes and nothing specific. And of course, the wind is blowing. This is so there is so much information that she gives us just the way that she's placed his body and the colors that she's used that lift us up so much because they're so bright and and it's so well done. It's so clever. Well, these are shapes. These are all shapes that we see here whether they're triangulated shapes or they're rough or they're half round or they're combinations of shapes. And they, these shapes are made with lines. And lines have their own inherent value because they tell us a story without us even being aware. Again, small example, this kind of a zigzag line. That kind of a zigzag line, if you saw a dog coming toward you and you could see this zigzag line, you'd be terrified. Whereas here's a dog bearing all his teeth and we see that he's friendly and we're giving a, given a lot of information with these other little lines and shapes. So there are vertical lines and there are horizontal lines. Vertical lines are among the strongest because they stand straight up out of the horizon and they tend to be more um, intertwined with kind of the maleness of a piece of art. 
Whereas say in the case of a horizontal line, which represents uh, mothers uh, cuddling their children, nursing their children, or in this case, obviously, uh, uh, Saint Mary holding Jesus in her uh, lap there. So we have these kind of horizontal line is more feminized. And it's a quite an amazing thing to see here, by the way, that when Chardin makes this painting of a poor little rabbit in a larder, all of us know full well that this rabbit is going to end up in that copper pot. He is tonight's dinner. But you can see what a difference it makes when this rabbit looks like it's been crucified. It's been annihilated by the hand of a man. And here it's so feminized because of the tender person that Georgia O'Keeffe was and because it has this component of being uh, almost saying grace over this animal that is going to provide you sustenance. These are horizontal and vertical lines. Here, we also can see that a line can be actual, say in the works of Mondrian, or they can be implied in the raft of the Medusa and the artist wants you to move across lines. He also wants you to experience space, which refers to distance or area between, around, above, below. So to create this kind of floating world that we see that Dolly has done here. And he also shows us that he's excellent at foreshortening, which was a Renaissance master skill. When artists try to convey to us texture, they know that say in the case of Vincent van Gogh, we could run our fingers across his work and there could be a half an inch to maybe three quarters of an inch of real texture made with oil paints, but our mind has texture memory. And because we have a memory of what velvet and what a rug feels like under our feet and what fur feels like on our clothing, then we can immediately get lost in a painting because of our mental memory. So now we have essentially covered those items list listed on the left. These are the tools that the artist has once he gets his brush out, his scissors out, et cetera. And now he has to think of ways to make everything harmonious. So we're going to look at the side on the right. The balance, emphasis, the harmony, the variety of things they paint, the, the way they create movement, rhythm, proportion, and pattern also has strict rules. And here are some of them. The principles of design is that you must use balance so that people, when they look at your work, can be, can be anchored in a place that is not uncomfortable. They can stand there and they can be easy with it. So one of the ways that you create this sometimes is with an asymmetrical result that we see here, but there's the, the balance is creating with this uh, some, uh, asymmetrical round and long cypress. Here we see kind of the mirror images that are used to create this American crucifix, if you will. I don't know if you've ever noticed this very patriotic red, white, and blue crucifix of an object found in the West and we and Georgia O'Keeffe. And then we see these kind of radial designs, which are again, designed specifically say rose windows or the kind of illustrations uh, to create this sense of balance. Let me show you an early work of Pollux. Do you think he understands something about color and balance and proportion? This is the kind of work that he did because he spent a lot of time when he lived in the city in New York in the Natural History Museum. So quite often you see totems and you see these kind of messages and automatic writing. Clearly, he's a man that knows how to use color well. He's a person that can make it dramatic when he needs to. He knows how to use shapes. He knows how to use contrast. He knows how to cre create a symmetrical design. And though this is considerably different from this side, there is that those equal amounts of balance and the shading and the light, everything, he's exquisite. This is absolutely exquisite. I don't think you can do better than this. 
emphasis is when, say, in the case of Gustav Kayabat, he wants us to look here first because these are the middle class people that have now acquired this newfangled umbrella. But in fact, everyone had to have an umbrella around the 1860s, 70s, the British invented umbrellas and it was something everyone had to have. Well, we can see what he's doing here. Proportionally, the people are large and consequently we look at them first, but let's not forget that everywhere else here, the artist wants you to continue to investigate who are these people? This is the reason he's using focal point perspective. He wants you to walk into his painting. You can visually see this and relate to how slippery those cobblestones are. Absolutely brilliant artist, Gustav Kayabat. And here we can see that the emphasis on this yellow pair makes it stand out because of the size and the color, but Obviously, everything is so beautifully synchronized, even kind of these lovely details and the reflection here, magnificent. Now, movement. Movement is usually done to create an illusion. And artists were interested in capturing movement uh, at, the, at the turn of the 20th century because the moving camera let them see these kind of motions one after another. So we see why Marcel Duchamp did this work. He is interested in creating a futuristic work that looks like it's a mechanized woman because from the knee down, this is the, 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 um, the, the bottom of a locomotive, say the locomotive on a train. So we see that he is creating, this man is creating an illusion of movement, sensory movement here. Uh, it's kind of the superimposition of a nude woman descending a staircase. Another example of how you use proportion when you compare elements and then the rhythm that we talk so much about, we can see here in the work of Robert Delaunay in which he uses the repetition of colors and textures and shapes and arrangements. Whereas say someone like Vincent van Gogh, we notice the pattern right away of these beautiful purple irises, but he wants to add a little interest to this work so that you don't get bored. So he's included in it uh, something incongruous with this or that, a white iris. And then we also always have to have balance. So we see that he's added white here as well. So the unity creates this kind of an agreement. In the same ways, if you have varieties of the same thing, but they're painted with different colors and different patterns, there, there is a variety as well as a unity. So we can see a lot of these things work together. Now we've covered both aspects of what is it that the artist has as his tools and then his design perspective. How is it that he's going to make the canvas appealing for you? Now, again, this is a challenge to you that I'm proposing now. At first, when you look at this work, and this was done during um, Jackson Pollock's Black Phase, when everyone said, okay, you did natural history, you did pictures of Buffalo, blah, blah, blah. What else can you do? And he had done colors as well, but now they wanted something else. He began to use black. So what we have to work here is uh, we have to see, did he follow the rules that we just talked about? Is there balance? Is there emphasis? Is there harmony? Is there variety? Is there movement? Is there rhythm or proportion? Is there a visual symphony going on here that we need to know about? Well, quite interesting. Even if you knew nothing more than we had just discussed for the last 20 minutes, you can see that there is a ballet going on here. You know that he worked on the floor in which he just rolled out the muslin or he rolled out the canvas and began to work on it with this kind of dance in which he, he even walked across his work because it was such a large piece. I think it might have been easily eight feet up and down. Let's see, we, yeah, we, so this woman is proportional to that. Yes, it could easily be eight feet uh, across. 
So this is the, 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 the what we see is that there, there, there are shapes that he's using and though there's it's kind of heavy here, then he has to make it kind of heavy there. And then everything is sort of wispy going out to the corners and then coming back. And there are layers upon layers here because he worked on this for days and weeks at a time and continued this kind of process of printing with his work essentially. He's sort of walking around with a turkey baster. He's walking around and making these kind of shapes and forms, but he wants your eye to travel across it and to wonder what is he trying to convey and is he indeed making the kind of art that you can relate to. This one is a little bit tough, but still the point is if you have pretty colors to look at in the way that we did in this work that is so unified and we have something to maybe suss out then you can you can understand why something like this is more challenging however we still want to find the and substantiate that he is using the appropriate rules that every artist uses Naturally, uh, Jackson Pollock was called an abstract expressionist and abstract expressionists were uh, in America. Abstract artists were from Europe. The abstract expressionists were uh, designated their, their kind of their own definition. So they are abstract expressionists. So this is abstract art and this is abstract art and this is abstract art. And we're going to come to some kind of decision about why this is an important piece of art as well. Well, this, so we can see that the kind of art that artists are making uh, at this time rely a great deal on the color components that they use and the shapes that they make and kind of the, the boxes that they choose to paint in. And so we, we have these, these kind of responses that are taking place. This is typically taking place right after World War I, where people like Kazimir Malevich have served in this frightful and devastating war. We have a lot of artists that are going to participate in the art world that served as soldiers and medics and saw every horror imaginable. But these artists that are so interested in making abstract art that use more color, and that want to convey to us their view of life are artists that are significantly influenced by color theory. And color theory and why these artists are particularly enamored with it is because they are not going to represent the world in its natural state. Consequently, color must speak for them. This is why someone like Jackson Pollock taking this risk by making this all black on white is to say that he's doing away with all artifice and he is giving you everything that is in his subconscious, essentially. They're bare basic bones. But say people like Juan Gris, who is doing this kind of work with colors and this kind of automatic painting, which is related to automatic writing, which was a big part of the Surrealist Manifesto, but we know what he's doing. He's creating these um, dream inspired, sometimes unfortunately even nightmare inspired kind of experiences that he's having, living in a tiny apartment from which he can see the Eiffel Tower and how glorious it is. And at the same time, he is a man that played a guitar. He paints himself here as a guitar and as a clown, as we know from the Harlequin, he play, he's, he's this ridiculous befuddled clown that has come to Paris to become a well-known artist and he's so hungry he has a hole in his stomach. Those artists that are using color and shapes to convey what they want to tell you have a huge job ahead of them. And in particular, at least say Juan Moreau's work is whimsical and you can get lost in it. You can sort of look around and wonder, what's he holding in his hand? Is it a bow for a violin that becomes a ladder that has an ear growing off it? And what's going on here? There's a cat that lives with him. 
uh, and, and another cat, what's, what's going, we don't know, but we do have some responses to these things because we recognize them in the real world. He was a charming fellow. He was a humorous fellow. So it's quite interesting that his work would turn out to be this kind of a whimsical look uh, that, that almost looks like an accident. But with Piet Mondrian, no such thing. Piet Mondrian is making this kind of work where there's no question, is he using implied line? Absolutely not. We can see every single line he's made here, even the line that he chooses not to finish. But you see, you have to know the context. What is the man saying? He is making the kind of art that is so minimalist because the German economy was completely destroyed after World War I, and they had virtually nothing with which to make furniture other than maybe pieces of wood, certainly no tufted chairs with velvets and fringe on them. And they had to build the kind of homes that were made of the simplest materials because no one could afford to have a fancy house built. Concrete is what you got and glass and maybe some steel. It's very, very different than poured in place concrete or marble or anything else that has design elements in it that creates a home the way that people used to see with, with the Victorian era, obviously until the 1900s with all the finials and the porches and the, all the nonsense that was part of the Victorian castle-like homes, you see what they've been reduced to. The way that they can decorate this home, which looks like a glass box, which is such a shock to live in because it's cold to begin with, and all of the other materials are cold, there's no wood, there's nothing to warm it up, you can at least use color to add to these design elements. One of the things that we see that is going on here is that Piet Mondrian is making the kind of work that is representational of what the life experience is at that time. There's still more to it, but let's say that's one way that we can step into this idea. Another thing is that prior to this time in 1907, there was an earth shattering moment when Brock and Picasso invent cubism and start to make art that is non-representational. Even though there were some artists that made work before this time that was uh, strangely colored and, and looked psychedelic, but this is now a transition into the art world where you start making the kind of art that is going to be a response. The 20th century is in large part going to be a response to cubism, to cubes. This is also the reason why we see these shapes here. This is all a response to cubism. This took the art world by storm because when you make the kind of art that doesn't exist in reality, you are tapping into your creative mind. Since artists are already creative people, then if they don't have to represent a realistic picture, their output can be limitless because they have millions of ideas. So now when we look at the work of Popova, so she's a Russian expatriate living in Paris at this time, 1917, and she is um, responding to cubism as well. And the way that Mondrian's work was more or less stiff, if you will, because he's Germanic and he's a man that was a perfect dancer because every single step was perfect. He was this kind of perfectionistic controlled person. What we see with her, is that though she is responding geometrically with soft colors, they, she has this added quality of her work floating. It is light. And this kind of introduction into moving from a world that is realistic to a world that is highly stylized and represented by someone's imagination is the reason why Brock and Picasso continue to work on the ideas that are being postulated by Cezanne with his cubes. We see the first idea that comes from Brock, uh, which will be adopted by all kinds of artists at this time. The cube, the triangle, and simple, simple forms are going to become a huge part of how abstract art will be conveyed. 
because they're the simplest shapes. And if you want the simplest shapes, you might want them because you have had a spiritual reckoning. You have had exposure and spirituality around this time in history was a very big thing. It started actually with Mary Todd in the White House having seances because she'd lost so many children. She wanted somehow to make contact with them. So this interest in the occult and the interest in uh, the worldview changing dramatically resulted in Vasily Kandinsky writing a kind of a pamphlet, if you will, on the spiritual aspect of modern art. This was read all over the European world among artists and people connected to them, and it even made its way to the United States. So now what we have is the artists that are going to be very much involved with the movements of the period and the social changes that are taking place so that their art becomes different because the whole world is different. One of the things that happens from the point that Charles Darwin publishes The Origin of Species is that all of the humanities continue to respond by saying, we are different than animals because we experience life in a much different way. Animals exist in the world. We as humans have a brain which is highly creative, sophisticated, productive, um, can do a lot of things, can come up with ideas, can execute those ideas, can make them a worldwide phenomenon. This is what happens with the shock of Charles Darwin until today. Even today, people refuse to admit that this Darwin's theories are plausible. Even though we know archaeology has answered and confirmed a lot of his positions. Well, one of the things, of course, that was problematic was this is that people were questioning church doctrine and then the church had a problem with um, you know, the six day thing. And on the seventh day, God rested. So we're not only being told that we are first cousins to monkeys, but we are told that the earth is much older, et cetera, et cetera. And with archaeology and interest in Egyptology and interest in sociology, and frankly, every ology you can imagine, the 1800s was a whirlwind of investigation into everything. Uh, this is the reason why photography was invented at this time. But the man's relationship to the universe changed so dramatically with these various aspects. And then the theory of psychoanalysis and the theory of relativity, all of these things were challenging to the extent that people felt uncomfortable in their skin. Well, what, one of the ways, of course, that people respond to Darwin is to make critical um, you know, cartoons of him, but in actual fact, when he comes up with these ideas and when he proposes uh, this kind of new way of looking at the world, one of the remedies to the fact that this was going up against church dogma was proposed by this woman called Helena Blavatsky, who founded the Theosophical Society in the United States. The Theosophical Society was a th synthesis of Darwin's ideas with uh, the, uh, the evolution of humankind physically. She began to apply it as uh, an evolution of the spirit and the soul. She was marrying the idea from all world religions with science and philosophy, and she saw absolutely no conflict if you could absorb the ideas that come from world religions, which are all generally trying to teach you to be tolerant, that everyone has their understanding of God, and that everyone's general idea is that what you consider onerous to you, you should not do to another. But one of the reasons that the humanities was so interested in putting a lot of emphasis on uh, spirituality is because it wanted desperately to restore man to his position of centrality and dignity in the universe because we had been compared to apes, chimpanzees. 
But those additional bits of information and the kind of the publication of her work here, uh, Isis Unveiled and uh, all of these various uh, documents and publications of hers were promoting the ideas that people can evolve physically, spiritually, mentally, and psychologically. So artists had to move away from making realistic representations of the world. They started to make representations that looked like your experiences in the spirit world. All of these ideas are bringing about this interest in what lives in the air. What kinds of things live in the air? What kinds of things, the thoughts that we have, the, the feelings that we have, the connection with something greater than ourselves, all of these things live in the air. Now, this, these things did not sell so well, and they were not so easily absorbed into the art community. So the way that Gauguin responded at the very same time, it was a, a contemporary of Redon, is he tried to make a more realistic representation of something that is somewhat supernatural. And he used this twig here, this branch of a tree, in which he separates the real world of these Breton women, who have just come out of church. That's why they were dressed in their white little caps. And they're thinking about the sermon they just heard and the story that they just heard about Jacob and the story of Genesis where he fights an angel. So he creates this realistic world and it is connected to an altered one, a spiritual one. Hilma of Clint was a devotee of Blavatsky, though she was Swedish. And as I said, Helena Blavatsky's work went all over the world. And there are still even today theosophical societies that are operating in which, uh, say, in the case of Hilma of Clint, she was a person that liked painting. So to her, this kind of representation of the evolution of the soul and this kind of um, extraterrestrial or, or um, uh, connections with the spirit world that we can't touch or feel or see, but it, it exists. She she's spent most of her life writing 23,000 pages of notes that had theosophical meaning. And she tried to create these kind of diagrams. She really wasn't making paintings per se, as she would tell it, but she was showing us how this kind of feminized and the masculine side here the, by the colors and by the value of the colors and how they become lighter as they go into this level of apotheosis where you are one with the universe. Her work actually looks more like diagrams than, say, someone like Kandinsky. Though Kandinsky was a man that not only followed um, Helena Blavatsky, and we know that um, Alfred Stieglitz in the United States printed and translated from German to English some of the work in this with his intrigue of the spirituality and art. It became a very well-received uh, pamphlet that artists could apply immediately to their work. Rudolf Steiner, who you see here, was a follower of hers. And uh, all of these people were intertwined. The people that were writing, people that were painting, making sculpture, all of the people involved in the humanities were very much taken by theosophy and by the fact that you can have uh, a spiritual connection with all other religions and therefore all of mankind. It's democratic, obviously, it's appealing. When we have Sigmund Freud postulating these ideas of dreamlike states, well, abstract art is going to be something like a dreamlike state, sometimes induced by heavy drinking. And say in the case where he teaches about the 90% um, of who we are is beneath what we saw, what we show to the public. You know, 90% of who we are is made up by our life experiences, our beliefs, our morals, etc. And what the public sees is very little. So this idea of psychoanalysis and stream of consciousness 
and the, 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 these flow of ideas that we have that are constant in all of our brains all day and all night, when we're not actively thinking, we're dreaming, and kind of this interest in the uh, color theories of which colors create an optical vibration. This is another thing that these artists and this theorist said is various colors. The reason that they are so complementary is because they create a sensitized optical vibration that we are living in a complex system of all kinds of uh, sensitivities that we have to the world. And consequently, the foves start to use these colors unnaturally because they want to the color and the shapes to speak more than they want you to get a realistic impression of the world. Now, uh, Kandinsky is naturally very influenced by all of these people. He knew I'm not sure if Kandinsky actually ever lived in Paris, to be honest with you, but I know that he was Russian. He lived in Germany. He probably lived in Vienna because he was good friends with Alfred Schoenberg, the composer. He was from Vienna. Uh, so all of these artists are talking about things that are taking place in Vienna, which is one of the art capitals at this time, turn of the century because of Klimt and the Vienna workshop and the, the other major capital of art is Paris. What you can see is happening with Kandinsky, realistic painting, it becomes more and more abstracted as he starts to speak with color, more so than realistic representations. Now, one of the things that he had going for him, lucky guy, if you want to be an abstract artist, is he had a condition known as synesthesia, so that when he listened to music, he saw color. Well, it's a great leap to make then if he's making kind of these strokes, let's say in this case of hearing a certain uh, chords or certain symphonic changes and kind of these um, ideas that are coming to him in his dreamlike state, in his spiritual state, and in and kind of in addition to this, the music that he's listening to, his work came to be known as free flowing abstract art, and hers came to be known as more spiritual focus, but rigid and really going to the same place, but getting there in two different ways. Here, what is charming about this is that Kandinsky has even added these scales because he's so immersed in his music and this flow of colors and shapes and um, these kind of beautiful motifs that he's choosing. Once he's sort of comfortable with these kind of abstracted forms, later they will become far more geometric, but the world keeps moving ahead. So that when the theory of relativity, when there is a new vision of the world about time and space and all of these revolutionary ideas that you might not be able to relate to as a regular person, but you could definitely relate to the age of speed because all around you, you saw increasing modes of transportation and they were all every year going faster and faster. This is why the abstract artist Giacomo Bala is making this work that looks like the, the, the volume of his movement is such that he can't even contain it within the frame. It is coming out of the frame. This is his futuristic response to this age of speed. What happens with Sonia Delaunay is she makes these kind of geometrical patterns, which are rigid in the way that say Hilma of Clint is. She's using a very big variety of colors here. And what she's trying to capture is these kind of rainbow colors that Paris turns into because in that time, 1914, they were changing over from gaslight to electric. So the city was absolutely turned into uh, a magical wonderland. So uh, she was kind of more contained. She and her husband did this kind of work, whereas we can see that this is more or less the same answer, kind of spiritual sensitized answer to how the world is changing and how 
our senses are experiencing these wondrous things. In the case of Paul Clay, who we see here making a representation of a very realistic vista we're all familiar with, and say uh, he is going to become interested in the Fauves as well. He will at some point though, make a trip to Tunisia where he had never seen light like this and colors like this in his life. He was from Switzerland and possibly uh, in Germany because he fought in World War I. Uh, to see these kind of golden stones and these blue, blue skies and blue water, he was so taken by the reflection of the water on the stones that he makes his answer in many ways to cubism. So this continued output that we see here is a minimalistic response to what people see with the human eye but transpose it in a way that is abstracted, that's colorful, and that permits them to uh, show you the unique personality that they have. In later years, many of the artists that we've just talked about, this is Vasily Kandinsky, Paul Clay, this is Walter Gropius, and many of the men here were uh, served in World War I. They founded the Bauhaus under the direction of Walter Gropius, and it became uh, a place where no student got an art education uh, before abstract modern art. It all began with modern art because modern art represented geometric simple designs. They were easier to replicate. They were democratic in their nature, as we said. And say a teacher like Johannes Itten and others like him used to have the students uh, listen to Buddhist chants. Uh, he even dressed like a monk and shaved his head because they wanted this school to reach students on a spiritual level so that they can create the kind of work that is simple and healing as well. Now, one of the reasons that we get this kind of simplicity from Piet Mondrian is because he says something that is truthful to all artists. Every true artist has been inspired more by the beauty of lines and color and the relationship between them than by the concrete subject of a picture. Again, as lay persons, we would not necessarily see shapes until someone makes them very obvious. This is Malevich in 1912, who is going to be in Russia many of the years of the Russian Revolution, where there will be one disaster after another, and where the Russian Revolution is going to uh, you know, push the idea that religion is the opiate of the masses, and that uh, and all churches were closed. All churches were closed, all Bibles were taken away, it was over. Though initially, um, the Russian revolutionaries and Lenin was very much pro-modern art because he said that this kind of art was okay. They didn't, uh, it, it, this was not so easily accepted in Russia because they're always 200 years behind Europe anyway, if not 200, certainly 100. But he was very much in favor of Kazimir Malevich doing this kind of work in Russia at the beginning of the time that Lenin was part of the Communist Party, though he's going to die pretty early into the uh, takeover of the Bolsheviks. But because he said Kazimir Malevich is getting to the nitty gritty, the, the very supreme innermost regions of our inner psyche, uh, and, and it's again, shapes, right, and colors, uh, and again, a response to cubism. What we can see that is happening here is why would someone like Lenin have approved of this? He more than likely approved of it because they were taking on a whole new challenge. Communism had never existed anywhere in the world where, say, democracy had already been a, a part of the history of the Greek and part of the Roman history as well. So for, for the Americans to bring back democracy as poorly as it works, still works in some areas, um, 
we have then this, this new world order where they're trying a brand new style of government that on paper looks highly democratic and fair. Uh, then when we look at this work made by Kazimir Malevich, we have to understand why on earth this man would have done this. And he did it four times, not just once, four times. Well, we have to know a little bit of Russian history to create the context. Because in every home in the Russian world for hundreds, if not I don't know if it's thousands, but certainly hundreds of years, where they had an icon's corner in every home where their most precious icon would sit in the corner, in the sharp edge here, and make this kind of unique corner in the house because this is a place where you pray to God, where you find your spiritual sustenance. You would have to know that when he painted the black square, it was placed where an icon would have been placed, not just in the corner, but in the uppermost corner. And say, so even when we have relatively fewer representations of Malevich's work here, we have to understand that there's an easy way to read what is happening here. If this is where you would normally put a religious icon and it's a black box, although we have a cross here that re is reminiscent of the Christian cross, to me, this says God is dead, which is precisely what the Russian government wanted people to think. If religion is the opiate of the masses, then your God is dictator Father Stalin. When Stalin took over, they did away with all the suprematism and cubism and any kind of ism that would be offensive because there are only going to be pictures of Stalin kissing babies and handing out flowers. That's how you create propaganda. If you make this kind of work, people question it. And if there's one thing that a dictator doesn't want you to question is maybe the validity of his election or the fact that he's sitting on the throne for decades. No one wants you to think if they're dictators. Well, maybe I'm wrong. I've never seen it written anywhere, but it certainly says that to me. And if nothing else, he is still creating some kind of an icon to modernism, if not religion. Still in all, we, none of us know what eventually can become of an idea. We have cubism, which in the art world and in the sculpture world was a response. The 20th and 21st century is still responding. That's what the minimalist movement is about. Who would have known the cubism would inspire one of the greatest and most glorious buildings ever made in the 20th century. The, oh, well, actually this one, I take that back. This one is the, the Weizmann, the Weizmann Museum of Art that's located in the University of Minnesota. Okay, this is 1993. This is the first time, this, uh, by the way, the outside here is um, aluminum. This is what this design is made, inspired by cubism. Again, when we saw Marcel Duchamp, he's inspired by cubism, the locomotive and the age of speed and the age of film creating this work. Well, then we have Frank Gehry who is making a dancing building as a result of the influence of Duchamp. And these kind of softer angles that we see there culminate in this building, which I made a mistake a few moments before. This is the Guggenheim Bilbao, which opened in 1997, and the exterior, I believe, is titanium. When I was lucky enough to go and see it for my eyes as this three-dimensional piece of art or sculpture that is a museum, I even noticed that the sandstone is composed here of different shades of Brown. And Kazimir Malevich, 
he too had an important architect follow his lead with these kind of moving and flying rectangles. Her name was Zaha Hadid. She was very much taken by the rhythm and the movement and the expression of his work when she made this painting. But all of her architectural accomplishments have to do with, say, in this case, a leisure club in Hong Kong, which just happens to jut out of a mountain and overlook the, uh, the city there. She is so much influenced by the proportions and the colors and the ideas that she found so influential in Malevich's work that almost everything she designs takes off. It flies. It's, it's an, these inspirational projects are space flying free. This is why we must always have a great deal of respect for artists that do something that is so completely new, because who knows how they will influence the art world beyond that. 